Hello and welcome to my talk on getting started with edge machine learning. My name is Robert and I'm an ARM innovator. I'm also an Edge Impulse expert and a Google developer expert for machine learning and the Google. Before we talk about edge machine learning, like us to talk about machine learning itself. Now, machine learning is popularly described as a field of study, which is devoted to teaching computers how to learn rules about data in order to make things. And machine learning is made possible by a number of things. The first one is the availability of large computing resources, what we typically call cloud computing. It's also made possible by cheap storage. And this cheap storage makes it possible for us, for us to store lots of data. So three things put together make machine learning possible. Now, you can throw out the very definition of machine learning and think of it in a very simple way. Data plus results will give rise to rules. What you're really interested in when you talk about machine learning is the rules that you need to know in order for your results to be produced. So typically you have a problem and you want a result. You need to know what the rules are. Machine learning comes in when you can't define those rules yourself, but you have historical examples of the data that goes in and the results that come out. Then machine learning helps you extract the rules. You could also think of those rules as patterns. So machine learning helps you extract rules from your data. Now, we call these rules hypothesis. So if you think about it from a mathematical perspective, what you're really saying is that given a certain uh, type of data, and you could call this your X and the result, which you would call your Y, you're then able to formulate hypothesis. So these rules are our hypothesis. Now, it's interesting when you think about a hypothesis because a hypothesis is just your first estimation. It doesn't need to be right. Now, putting data back into the hypothesis gives us our results. Of course, that assumes that our hypothesis is right. Now, machine learning is the process of refining our hypothesis. So it's okay to start with a hypothesis that isn't correct, but through the process of machine learning, you get to refine that hypothesis over time. Now, when you're done with the hypothesis, you're then able to carry out inference. So the hypothesis is our trained model. And so we're able to make use of that trained model to infer something. And we can ask questions. For example, in the image on the screen, one question could be, what animal do we have in the image? Another question could be, how many animals do we have in the image? And a third question could be, where are these animals in the image? And what we're asking in this particular question is, can you give us bounding boxes that tell us the coordinates of the locations of these images? So one example of that is a localization problem. Another example is a segmentation problem. So machine learning deals with models. What are the inputs to these models? There are different types of inputs. Uh, one example is images and videos, which would come from cameras. Another example would be sound, which would come from microphones. Another example would be time series data, which would come from sensors. And by time series data, what we mean is data that is collected at 
regular intervals. And then another type of input could be text. And this text could be structured or unstructured. When we say that the text is structured, what we mean is that it is in tabular format. And think of you know, your Excel spreadsheets, data in there that is strictly text would be structured. And when we say that the data is unstructured, we just mean that it's a body of text. So if you were to uh, go to a dictionary, for example, you would have lots and lots of sentences. Or if you were to check a news site with text, then that would be unstructured data. So these are just examples of inputs to your models. And what that means is these are things that you could be passing into a model and asking that model to perform inference. So what then is edge machine learning? It's simply the process of running machine learning models on edge devices. Now, there's a limit to what we try to do, so we don't talk about training machine learning models on edge devices. That would just be too much. we would be asking too much of those devices. So what we're saying is, how can you run machine learning models on edge devices? And that sounds simple enough. Now, when you think about what sort of machine learning you would want to carry out on edge devices, uh, there's quite a number. Uh, one example could be activity recognition. So if you think about a wearable device, can you tell when the wearer is inactive can you tell when the wearer is active and the wearer is in motion? But even when you can tell that the wearer is in motion, can you tell what exactly the wearer is doing? Is the wearer walking? Is the wearer running? Is the wearer riding a bicycle? There's also weak word detection. And you think of this from the example of an edge device that goes into sleep mode and then wakes up to do something when a certain word or combination of words is mentioned. And so if you think about some of the smart home devices that are voice controlled, that's weak word detection. Another example would be image recognition. So how do you get an edge device to do something when the camera on that device recognizes a particular object? or an animal or a person. So an example would be, for example, how do you turn on cooling in a building if the edge device recognizes humans on a camera? Now, we've got lots and lots of applications for edge ML. If you think of industrial applications, you could be thinking of things like fault detection on factory lines. Uh, you could be thinking of things like precision agriculture. So just think of all of these sensors and how you would put them together to accomplish precision agriculture. You could also think of this from a health perspective. So how do you detect falls, especially in elderly people, and then do something with it, right? So the iWatch, the Apple Watch has something like that. And now you can start to think of how exactly it does that. You could also think of uh, people who are susceptible to seizures who live alone. How do you know when they have a seizure and how do you notify somebody else? Now, while we see examples of what we could use edge machine learning for, it's important to then go back and talk about some of the challenges of machine learning in general and edge machine learning in particular. So the first thing to note is that machine learning can be computationally intensive. The model or the hypothesis relies on a bunch of mathematical operations. And there could be a lot of these operations that need to happen inside of a model.
Another thing to note when it comes to models is that some of them can be extremely large, especially when you get to models that um, implement deep convolutional neural networks. So these are models that are required for computer vision. And when we say large, what we mean is that there could be a large number of parameters. As an example, let's look at mobile net V2. This is a model that is optimized for use on mobile devices. So in terms of machine learning models, this model is quite small. It has slightly less accuracy than models that are optimized for running on computers and servers. However, this model has anywhere between 1.7 million and 6.9 million parameters. And it has 585 million multiply add operations. To train this model, you need 16 GPUs running on a server. And when you're done, the file that you get, which is the model itself, the saved model, is about 130 MB in size. And then training this particular model requires the use of Python. So if you come from a traditional embedded systems background where you're only conversant with C and C++, then all of these things could just prove to be a hindrance to getting started. Now, the problem with the size of something like MobileNet V2 is that if you took a slightly above average microcontroller, such as what I have on this, uh, on the screen right now, it's an Arduino Potenta H7. It's part of the Arduino Pro line. It runs an uh, STM32 H747 from ST microcontrollers, and it runs at, uh, sorry, ST microelectronics, and it runs at up to 480 megahertz. Clearly that just implies that it's gonna consume quite a bit of power. Uh, by default, it comes with eight megabytes of RAM, but you could get it with up to 64 megabytes. Uh, but clearly, whatever it is that, that you have isn't going to handle that 130 megabyte uh, model that we have. Uh, and then you're already talking about running it at five volts, right? So clearly, this isn't something that you would put into a deep, deeply embedded application. You wouldn't run this on a coil, coin cell battery, but you could run this in, a, in an industrial setting, like in a factory. But what you see is that you can't get that mobile nets V2 to fit onto this microcontroller. So what that means is we need to think about this differently. And so the solution really is that we need to reduce everything. We need to come up with a model with fewer computations. We need to reduce or eliminate floating point arithmetic. Uh, we need to get models that will fit into the memory of whatever microcontroller it is that you decide to work with. And more importantly, we need to convert these models into C structures so that you can work with them within C or C++ on your microcontroller. Now, there's a whole lot to be said about all of these, but how do you get started with machine learning? Well, there are two options. One is that you could just learn the practicals uh, with something like Edge Impulse. And what that does for you is it will let you train your model. So you bring your data, you know what the output is that you want. You train your model, you deploy it to your Edge device. And then you can take your time to understand what's going on. And the more you understand about what's going on, the better the models are that you're able to train. Now, the second option is to learn the theory first. So get an understanding of how things work, meaning go learn Python, learn uh, how to train a model on a computer, 
learn how to uh, convert that model into something that will work on a microcontroller, learn the various things that connect models together because you don't just train models. So you start with data, you have to do some sort of exploratory analysis. Maybe you have to clean up the data. Maybe you have to do some sort of feature engineering. A lot of the time you have to do some sort of feature engineering, right? But then if you learn the theory, at the end of the day, you can build products. So what's the difference? Practical first approach is usually good for people who are just building end products, right? So if you look at that portenta, for example, you want to just take the portenta and build an industrial application, then what you really need is just a practical first approach. Uh, you need to just have your data, see things work, and then, you know, iterate over time. And so something like Edge Impulse will be a good platform for you to get started with um, Edge ML in this particular case. But what if you're not building products on top of uh, something like the Portenta? What if you are building the Portenta? So what if you work for a manufacturer where you need to select different sensors and different microprocessing units and, and bring them together, build a microcontroller, a, a system on chip module, maybe even an FPGA. Then at that point, you actually need to understand the theory of these things. Why? Because you're going to be training models that work with your particular product. That product might not be something that a platform like Edge Impulse understands. You might need to even embed example models in that product so that end users have a starting point. Now, it might also be that you just need to squeeze the last performance out of a microcontroller. So you might not be building the, the uh, boards, but it's possible that you've trained models and they just don't fit too well on the microcontroller or they fit, but you're not getting the kind of performance you want. So you want to squeeze performance out of these things. And what that means is you need to understand the underlying function, the, the theory behind these things so that you're able to remove what you don't need or even optimize some of the things, right? So if you think of, a situation in which you have to work in research, then you need to understand the theory. And for the theory, you need something like TensorFlow Lite and TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. You can find out about both of them from the URL on the screen. So I've come to the end of my talk, but please visit the two URLs that I put up earlier. And while I'm not there in person, I'm sure that we will have a channel in which you can post questions and then I can answer those questions. Thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of your day.